The First Letter of Paul to the Corinthians Appeal to Unity 1. Paul, called an apostle, special messenger, personally chosen representative of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and our brother, Sothenes, to the Church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified, set apart, made holy in Christ Jesus, who are selected and called as saints, God's people, together with all those who in every place call on and honor the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace, inner calm and spiritual well-being from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always for you because of the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, so that in everything you were exceedingly enriched in him, in all speech, empowered by the spiritual gifts, and in all knowledge, with insight into the faith. In this way, our testimony about Christ was confirmed and established in you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift which comes from the Holy Spirit, as you eagerly wait with confident trust for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. And he will also confirm you to the end, keeping you strong and free of any accusation, so that you will be blameless and beyond reproach in the day of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. He is reliable, trustworthy, and ever true to his promise. He can be depended on. And through him you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. But I urge you, believers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in full agreement in what you say, and that there will be no divisions or factions among you, but that you be perfectly united in your way of thinking and in your judgment about matters of the faith. For I have been informed about you, my brothers and sisters, by those of close household, that there are quarrels and factions among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you says, I am a disciple of Paul, or I am a disciple of Apollos, or I am a disciple of Cephas, Peter, or I am a disciple of Christ. Has Christ been divided into different parts? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? Certainly not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say that you were baptized into my name. Now I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me as an apostle to baptize, but commissioned and empowered me to preach the good news of salvation, not with clever or eloquent speech as an orator, so that the cross of Christ would not be made ineffective, deprived of its saving power. The wisdom of God. For the message of the cross is foolishness and absurd and illogical to those who are perishing and spiritually dead because they reject it. But to us who are being saved by God's grace, it is the manifestation of the power of God. For it is written and forever remains written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the philosophy of the philosophers, and the cleverness of the clever, who do not know me, I will nullify. Where is the wise man, philosopher? Where is the scribe, scholar? Where is the debater, logician, orator of this age? Has God not exposed the foolishness of this world's wisdom? For since the world, through all its earthly wisdom, failed to recognize God, God in his own wisdom was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached regarding salvation to save those who believe in Christ and welcome him as Savior. For Jews demand signs attesting miracles, and Greeks pursue worldly wisdom and philosophy. But we preach Christ crucified, a message which is to Jews a stumbling block that provokes their opposition, and to Gentiles foolishness just utter nonsense. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This is because the foolishness of God is not foolishness at all, and it is wiser than men, far beyond human comprehension, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, far beyond the limits of human effort. Just look at your own calling, believers. Not many of you were considered wise according to human standards, not many powerful or influential, not many of high and noble birth. But God has selected for his purpose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, revealing their ignorance. And God has selected for his purpose the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, revealing their frailty. 
God has selected for his purpose the insignificant base of things of the world, and the things that are despised and treated with contempt, even the things that are nothing, so that he might reduce to nothing the things that are, so that no one may be able to boast in the presence of God. But it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom, from God revealing his plan of salvation and righteousness, making us acceptable to God, and sanctification making us holy and setting us apart for God, and redemption, providing our ransom from the penalty for sin. So then, as it is written in Scripture, he who boasts and glories, let him boast and glory in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2, Paul's Reliance Upon the Spirit And when I came to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming to you the testimony of God concerning salvation through Christ, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, no lofty words or eloquence or of philosophy as a Greek orator might do. For I made the decision to know nothing, that is to forego philosophical or theological discussions regarding inconsequential things and opinions, while among you accept Jesus Christ, and him crucified, and the meaning of his redemptive, substitutionary death and his resurrection. I came to you in a state of weakness and fear and great trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom using clever rhetoric, but they were delivered in demonstration of the Holy Spirit operating through me, and of his power stirring the minds of the listeners and persuading them, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom and rhetoric of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do speak wisdom among those spiritually mature believers who have teachable hearts and a greater understanding, but it is a higher wisdom, not the wisdom of this present age nor of the rulers and leaders of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the wisdom once hidden from man, but now revealed to us by God, that wisdom, which God predestined before the ages to our glory, to lift us into the glory of his presence. None of the rulers of this age recognized and understood this wisdom, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written in Scripture, things which the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him, who hold him in affectionate reverence, who obey him, and who gratefully recognize the benefits that he has bestowed. For God has unveiled them and revealed them to us through the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things diligently, even sounding and measuring the profound depths of God, the divine counsels, and things far beyond human understanding. For what person knows the thoughts and motives of a man except the man's spirit within him? So also no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, so that we may know and understand the wonderful things freely given to us by God. We also speak of these things not in words taught or supplied by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual thoughts with spiritual words for those being guided by the Holy Spirit. But the natural unbelieving man does not accept the things, the teachings, and revelations of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness, absurd, and illogical to him, and he is incapable of understanding them, because they are spiritually discerned and appreciated, and he is unqualified to judge spiritual matters. But the spiritual man, the spiritually mature Christian, judges all things, questions, examines, and applies what the Holy Spirit reveals, yet is himself judged by no one. The unbeliever cannot judge and understand the believer's spiritual nature. For who has known the mind and purposes of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, to be guided by his thoughts and purposes. 1 Corinthians 3, Foundations for Living However, brothers and sisters, I could not talk to you as to spiritual people, but only as to worldly people dominated by human nature, mere infants in the new life in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Even now you are still not ready. You are still worldly, controlled by ordinary impulses, the sinful capacity. For as long as there is jealousy and strife and discord among you, are you not unspiritual, and are you not walking like ordinary men unchanged by faith? For when one of you says, I am a disciple of Paul, 
and another, I am a disciple of Apollos, are you not proving yourselves unchanged, just ordinary people? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul, just servants through whom you believed in Christ, even as the Lord appointed to each his task? I planted, Apollos watered, but God, all the while, was causing the growth. So neither is the one who plants nor the one who waters anything, but only God who causes the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, in importance and esteem, working towards the same purpose. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, his servants working together. You are God's cultivated field, his garden, his vineyard, God's building. According to the remarkable grace of God, which was given to me to prepare me for my task, like a skillful master builder, I laid a foundation, and now another is building on it, but each one must be careful how he builds on it, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. But if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will be clearly shown for what it is. For the day of judgment will disclose it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality and character and worth of each person's work. If any person's work which he has built on this foundation, that is, any outcome of his effort remains and survives this test, he will receive a reward. But if any person's work is burned up by the test, he will suffer the loss of his reward, yet he himself will be saved but only as one who has barely escaped through fire. Do you not know and understand that you, the church, are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells permanently in you, collectively and individually? If anyone destroys the temple of God, corrupting it with false doctrine, God will destroy the destroyer, for the temple of God is holy, sacred, and that is what you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool, discarding his worldly pretensions and acknowledging his lack of wisdom, so that he may become truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness, absurdity, stupidity before God. For it is written in Scripture, He is the one who catches the wise and clever in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the humanly wise that they are useless. So let no one boast in men about their wisdom, or of having this or that one as a leader, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, Peter, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things are yours, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. 1 Corinthians 4 Servants of Christ So then, let us who minister be regarded as servants of Christ, and stewards, trustees, administrators of the mysteries of God that he chooses to reveal. In this case, moreover, it is required as essential and demanded of the stewards that one be found faithful and trustworthy. But as for me personally, it matters very little to me that I may be judged by you or any human court on this point. In fact, I do not even judge myself. I am aware of nothing against myself, and I feel blameless, but I am not by this acquitted before God. It is the Lord who judges me. So do not go on passing judgment before the appointed time, but wait until the Lord comes, for he will both bring to light the secret things that are hidden in darkness and disclose the motives of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now I have applied these things, that is, the analogies about factions, to myself and Apollos for your benefit, believers, so that you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written in Scripture, so that none of you will become arrogant and boast in favor of one minister or teacher against the other. For who regards you as superior, or what sets you apart as special? What do you have that you did not receive from another? And if in fact you received it from God or someone else, why do you boast as if you had not received it but had gained it by yourself? You behave as if you are already filled with spiritual wisdom and in need of nothing more. Already you have become so rich in spiritual gifts. You and your conceit have ascended your thrones and become kings without us. And how I wish that it were true, and that you did reign as kings, so that we might reign with you. For, I think, God has exhibited us apostles at the end of the line, like men sentenced to death and paraded as prisoners in a procession. 
because we have become a spectacle to the world, a show in the world's amphitheater, both to angels and to men. We are regarded as fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are highly esteemed, but we are dishonored. To this present hour we are both hungry and thirsty. We are continually poorly dressed, and we are roughly treated and wander homeless. We work for our living, working hard with our own hands. When we are reviled and verbally abused, we bless. When we are persecuted, we take it patiently and endure. When we are slandered, we try to be conciliatory and answer softly. We have become like the scum of the world, the dregs of all things until now. I do not write these things to shame you, but to warn and advise you as my beloved children. For even if you were to have ten thousand teachers to guide you in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers who led you to Christ and assumed responsibility for you. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the good news of salvation. So I urge you, be imitators of me just as a child imitates his father. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord and he will remind you of my way of life in Christ, my conduct, and my precepts for godly living, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some of you have become arrogant and pretentious, as though I were not coming to see you, but I will come to you soon. If the Lord is willing, and I will find out not just the talk of these arrogant people, but evaluate their spiritual power, whether they live up to their own claims. For the kingdom of God is not based on talk, but on power." Which do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline and correction, or with love and a gentle spirit? 1 Corinthians 5 Immorality Rebuked It is actually reported everywhere that there is sexual immorality among you, a kind of immorality that is condemned even among the unbelieving Gentiles, that someone has an intimate relationship with his father's wife. And you are proud and arrogant, You should have mourned in shame so that the man who has done this disgraceful thing would be removed from your fellowship. For I, though absent from you in body but present in spirit, have already passed judgment on him who has committed this act as if I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I am with you in spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to hand over this man to Satan for the destruction of his body, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting over the supposed spirituality of your church is not good. Indeed, it is vulgar and inappropriate. Do you not know that just a little leaven ferments the whole batch of dough? Just a little sin corrupts a person or an entire church? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new batch, just as you are still unleavened. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of vice and malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and untainted truth. I wrote you in my previous letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not meaning the immoral people of this world or the greedy ones and swindlers or idolaters, for then you would have to get out of the world and human society altogether. But actually I have written to you not to associate with any so-called Christian brother if he is sexually immoral or greedy, or is an idolater, devoted to anything that takes the place of God, or is a reviler who insults or slanders or otherwise verbally abuses others, or is a drunkard or a swindler. You must not so much as eat with such a person. For what business is it of mine to judge outsiders, non-believers? Do you not judge those who are within the church to protect the church as the situation requires? God alone sits in judgment on those who are outside the faith. Remove the wicked one from among you. Expel him from your church. 1 Corinthians 6. Lawsuits Discouraged Does any one of you, when he has a complaint, civil dispute, with another believer, dare to go to law before unrighteous men, non-believers, instead of placing the issue before the saints, God's people. Do you not know that the saints, God's people, will one day judge the world? If the world is to be judged by you, are you not competent to try trivial, insignificant, petty cases? Do you not know that we believers will judge angels? How much more, then, as to matters of this life? So if you have lawsuits dealing with matters of this life, Are you appointing those as judges to hear disputes who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. 
Can it be that there is not one wise man among you who is governed by integrity and will be able and competent to decide private disputes between his fellow believers? But instead, brothers go to law against brother, and that before judges who are unbelievers? Why, the very fact that you have lawsuits with one another is already a defeat. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, it is you who wrong and defraud, and you do this even to your brothers and sisters. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate by perversion, nor those who participate in homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, those whose words are used as weapons to abuse, insult, humiliate, intimidate, or slander, nor swindlers will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God. Any such were some of you before you believed, but you were washed by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. You were sanctified, set apart for God, and made holy. You were justified, declared free of the guilt in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit of our God, the source of the believer's new life and changed behavior. The body is the Lord's. Everything is permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be enslaved to anything and brought under its power, allowing it to control me. Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will do away with both of them. The body is not intended for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body, to save, sanctify, and raise it again because of the sacrifice of the cross. And God has not only raised the Lord to life, but will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Am I therefore to take the members of Christ and make them part of a prostitute? Certainly not. Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, two shall be one flesh. But the one who is united and joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run away from sexual immorality in any form, whether thought or behavior, whether visual or written. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the one who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and that you are not your own property? You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. So then, honor and glorify God with your body. 1 Corinthians 7 teaching on marriage. Now as to the matters of which you wrote, it is good, beneficial, advantageous for a man not to touch a woman outside marriage. But because of the temptation to participate in sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his marital duty to his wife with goodwill and kindness, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have exclusive authority over her own body, but the husband shares with her, and likewise the husband does not have exclusive authority over his body, but the wife shares with him. Do not deprive each other of marital rights, except perhaps by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves unhindered to prayer, but come together again so that Satan will not tempt you to sin because of your lack of self-control. But I am saying this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were as I am, but each person has his own gift from God, one of this kind and one of that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, that as a practical matter it is good if they remain single and entirely devoted to the Lord as I am. But if they do not have sufficient self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But to the married believers I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife is not to separate from her husband, but even if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not leave his wife. To the rest I declare, I, not the Lord, since Jesus did not discuss this, that if any believing brother has a wife who does not believe in Christ, and she consents to live with him, he must not leave her. And if any believing woman has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified, that is, he receives the blessing guaranteed through his Christian wife, 
and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise your children would be ceremonially unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner leaves, let him leave. In such cases, the remaining brother or sister is not spiritual or morally bound, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband by leading him to Christ? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife by leading her to Christ? Only let each one live the life which the Lord has assigned him, and to which God has called him, for each person is unique and is accountable for his choices and conduct. Let him walk in this way. This is the rule I make in all the churches. Was any one at the time of his calling from God already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has any one been called while uncircumcised? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was when he was called. Were you a slave when you were called? Do not worry about that, since your status as a believer is equal to that of a freeborn believer. But if you are able to gain your freedom, do that. For he who was a slave when he was called in the Lord is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when he was called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price, a precious price paid by Christ. Do not become slaves to men, but to Christ. Brothers, let each one remain with God in that condition in which he was when he was called. Now concerning the virgins of marriageable age, I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think then that because of the impending distress, that is, the pressure of the current trouble, it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you unmarried? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned in doing so. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned in doing so. Yet those who marry will have troubles, special challenges, in this life, and I am trying to spare you that. But I say this, believers, the time has been shortened, so that from now on even those who have wives should be as though they did not, and those who weep as though they did not weep and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess anything, and those who use the world taking advantage of its opportunities as though they did not make full use of it. For the outward form of this world, its present social and material nature is passing away. But I want you to be free from concern. The unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord, but the married man is concerned about worldly things, how he may please his wife, and his interests are divided. The unmarried woman or the virgin is concerned about the matters of the Lord, how to be holy and set apart both in body and in spirit. But a married woman is concerned about worldly things, how she may please her husband. Now I say this for your own benefit, not to restrict you, but to promote what is appropriate and secure, undistracted devotion to the Lord. But if any man thinks that he is not acting properly and honorably towards his virgin daughter by not permitting her to marry, if she is past her youth and it must be so, let him do as he wishes. He does not sin, let her marry. But the man who stands firmly committed in his heart, having no compulsion to yield to his daughter's request, and has authority over his own will, and has decided in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter from the being married, he will do well. So then both the father who gives his virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. A wife is bound to her husband by law as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry whomever she wishes, only provided that he too is in the Lord. But in my opinion, a widow is happier if she stays as she is, and I think that I also have the Spirit of God in this matter. 1 Corinthians 8. Take care with your liberty. Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge concerning this. Knowledge alone makes people self-righteously arrogant, but love, that unselfishly seeks the best for others, builds up and encourages others to grow in wisdom. If anyone imagines that he knows and understands anything of divine matters without love, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God with awe-filled reverence, obedience, and gratitude, he is known by him as his very own and is greatly loved. In this matter, then, of eating food offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, it has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. 
For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, who is the source of all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things that have been created, and we believers exist and have life and have been redeemed through him. However, not all believers have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed throughout their lives to thinking of the idol until now as real and living, still eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and because their conscience is weak, it is defiled, guilty, ashamed. Now food will not commend us to God, nor bring us close to him. We are no worse off if we do not eat, nor are we better if we do eat. Only be careful that this liberty of yours, this power to choose, does not somehow become a stumbling block, that is, a temptation to sin, to the weak in conscience. For if someone sees you, a person having knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, then if he is weak, will he not be encouraged to eat things sacrificed to idols and violate his own convictions? For through your knowledge, spiritual maturity, this weak man is ruined, that is, he suffers in his spiritual life, the brother for whom Christ died. And when you sin against the brothers and sisters in this way, and wound their weak conscience by confusing them, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if my eating a certain food causes my brother to stumble, sin, I will not eat such meat ever again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. 1 Corinthians 9 Paul's Use of Liberty Am I not free, unrestrained, and exempt from any obligation? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our risen Lord in person? Are you not the result and proof of my work in the Lord? If I am not considered an apostle to others, at least I am one to you. For you are the seal and the certificate and the living evidence of my apostleship in the Lord confirming and authenticating it. This is my defense to those who would put me on trial and interrogate me concerning my authority as an apostle. Have we not the right to our food and drink at the expense of the churches? Have we not the right to take along with us a believing wife, as do the rest of the apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas Peter? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to stop doing manual labor in order to support our ministry? Consider this. Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? Do I say these things only from a man's perspective? Does the law not endorse the same principles? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, to keep it from eating the grain. Is it only for oxen that God cares? Or does he speak entirely for our sake? Yes, it was written for our sake, the plowman out to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the harvest. If we have sown the good seed of spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share in this rightful claim over you, do not we even more? However, we did not exercise this right, but we put up with everything so that we will not hinder the spread of the good news of Christ. Do you not know that those who officiate in the sacred services of the temple eat from the temple offerings of meat and bread, and those who regularly attend the altar have their share from the offerings brought to the altar? So also on the same principle the Lord directed those who preach the gospel to get their living from the gospel. But I have used none of these privileges, nor am I writing this to suggest that any such provision be made for me now. For it would be better for me to die than to have anyone deprive me of my boast in this matter of financial support. For if I merely preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast about. For I am compelled, that is, absolutely obligated to do it. Woe to me if I do not preach the good news of salvation. For if I do this work of my own free will, then I have a reward. But if it is not of my will, but God's choosing, I have been entrusted with a sacred stewardship. What then is my reward? Just this that when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge to everyone, so as not to take advantage of my rights as a preacher and an apostle in preaching the gospel. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to everyone so that I may win more for Christ. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews for Christ. 
To men under the law I became as one under the law, though not being under the law myself, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without outside the law I became as one without the law, though I am not without the law of God but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as the weak, to win the weak. I had become all things to all men, so that I may by all means in any and every way save some by leading them to faith in Jesus Christ. And I do all this for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings along with you. Do you not know that in a race all runners run their very best to win, but only one receives the prize? Run your race in such a way that you may seize the prize and make it yours. Now every athlete who goes into training and competes in the games is disciplined and exercises self-control in all things. They do it to win a crown that withers, but we do it to receive an imperishable crown that cannot wither. Therefore I do not run without a definite goal. I do not flail around like one beating the air, just shadow boxing. But like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached the gospel to others, I myself will not somehow be disqualified as unfit for service. 1 Corinthians 10. Avoid Israel's Mistakes For I do not want you to be unaware, believers, that our fathers were all under the cloud in which God's presence went before them, and they all passed miraculously and safely through the Red Sea. And all of them were baptized into Moses, into his safe keeping as their leader, in the cloud and in the sea. And all of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not well pleased with most of them. For they were scattered along the ground in the wilderness because their lack of self-control led to disobedience which led to death. Now these things, the warnings and admonitions, took place as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they did. Do not be worshippers of handmade gods, as some of them were, just as it is written in Scripture. The people sat down to eat and drink after sacrificing to the golden calf at Horeb, and stood up to play, indulging in immoral activities. We must not indulge in nor tolerate sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 suddenly fell dead in a single day. We must not tempt the Lord, that is, test his patience, question his purpose, or exploit his goodness, as some of them did, and they were killed by serpents. And do not murmur in unwarranted discontent, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and warning to us. They were written for our instruction to admonish and equip us, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let the one who thinks he stands firm, immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience, nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with the temptation, he has in the past and is now, and will always provide the way out as well, so that you will be able to endure it without yielding and will overcome temptation with joy. Therefore, my beloved, run. Keep far, far away from any sort of idolatry, and that includes loving anything more than God or participating in anything that leads to sin and enslaves the soul. I am speaking as to wise and sensible people, Judge carefully and thoughtfully consider for yourselves what I say. Is the cup of blessing which we bless at the Lord's Supper not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Indeed it is. Is the bread which we break not a sharing in the body of Christ? Indeed it is. Since there is one bread, we believers who are many are united into one body, for we all partake of the one bread which represents the body of Christ. Consider the people of Israel. Are those who eat the sacrifices not partners of the altar united in their worship of the same God? Indeed they are. What do I mean then? That a thing offered to idols is anything special or changed simply because it is offered or that an idol is anything? On the contrary, the things which the Gentiles, pagans, sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons, in effect, and not to God. And I do not want you to become partners with demons by eating at feasts in pagan temples. 
You cannot drink both the Lord's cup and the cup of demons. You cannot share in both the Lord's table and the table of demons, thereby becoming partners with them. Do we really provoke the Lord to jealousy when we eat food sacrificed to handmade gods at a pagan feast? Are we spiritually stronger than he? Certainly not. He knows that the idols are nothing, but we deeply offend him. All things are lawful, that is, morally legitimate and permissible, but not all things are beneficial or advantageous. All things are lawful, but not all things are constructive to character and edifying to spiritual life. Let no one seek only his own good, but also that of the other person. Regarding meat offered to idols, eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking any questions for the sake of your conscience. For the whole earth is the Lord's and everything that is in it. If one of the unbelievers invites you to a meal at his home, and you want to go, eat whatever is served to you without asking questions about its source for the sake of your conscience. But if anyone says to you, this meat has been offered in sacrifice to an idol, do not eat it out of consideration for the one who told you, and for consciousness' sake. And by conscience I mean for the sake of the other man's, not yours. For why is my freedom of choice judged by another's conscience, another's ethics, another's sense of right and wrong. If I take my share of food with thankfulness, why am I accused because of something for which I give thanks? So then, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of our great God. Do not offend Jews or Greeks or even the church of God, but live to honor him. Just as I please everyone in all things, as much as possible adapting myself to the interest of others, not seeking my own benefit, but that of the many." so that they will be open to the message of salvation and may be saved. 1 Corinthians 11 Christian Order Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. I praise and appreciate you because you remember me in everything, and you firmly hold to the traditions, the substance of my instructions, just as I have passed them on to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head, authority over every man, and man is the head of woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who prays or prophesies with something on his head dishonors his head, and the one who is his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies when she has her head uncovered disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved in disgrace. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, she should cover her head. A man ought not to have his head covered during worship since he is the image and reflected glory of God, but the woman is the expression of man's glory. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed man was not created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. Therefore the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head, for the sake of the angels, so as not to offend them. Nevertheless, Woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also man is born through the woman. And all things, whether male or female, originate from God as their creator. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to offer prayer to God publicly with her head uncovered? Does not common sense itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her ornament and glory." for her long hair is given to her as a covering. Now if anyone is inclined to be conscientious about this, we have no other practice in worship than this, nor do the churches of God in general. But in giving this next instruction, I do not praise you, because when you meet together it is not for the better but for the worse. For in the first place, when you meet together in church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For doubtless there have to be factions among you, so that those who are of approved character may be clearly recognized among you. So when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For when you eat, each one hurries to get his own supper first, not waiting for others or the poor. So one goes hungry while another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those impoverished believers who have nothing? What will I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? And this I will not praise you. The Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord himself that instruction which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, 
This is represents my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that is unworthy of him will be guilty of profaning and sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. But a person must prayerfully examine himself and his relationship to Christ, and only when he has done so should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without solemn reverence and heartfelt gratitude for the sacrifice of Christ eats and drinks a judgment on himself if he does not recognize the body of Christ. That careless and unworthy participation is the reason why many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep in death. But if we evaluated and judged ourselves honestly, recognizing our shortcomings and correcting our behavior, we would not be judged. But when we fall short and are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined by undergoing His correction, so that we will not be condemned to eternal punishment along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat the Lord's Supper, wait for one another, and see to it that no one is left out. If anyone is too hungry to wait, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment on yourselves. About the remaining matters of which I was informed, I will take care of them when I come. 1 Corinthians 12 The Use of Spiritual Gifts now about the spiritual gifts, the special endowments given by the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led off after the speechless idols. However, you were led off whether by impulse or habit. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the power and influence of the Spirit of God can say, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is my Lord, except by the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. Now there are distinctive varieties of spiritual gifts, special abilities given by the grace and extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit operating in believers, but it is the same Spirit who grants them and empowers believers. And there are distinctive varieties of ministries and service, but it is the same Lord who is served. And there are distinctive ways of working to accomplish things, but it is the same God who produces all things in all believers, inspiring, energizing, and empowering them. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit, the spiritual illumination, and the enabling of the Holy Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Holy Spirit the power to speak, the message of wisdom, and to another the power to express, the word of knowledge and understanding according to the same Spirit. To another, wonder-working faith is given by the same Holy Spirit, and to another, the extraordinary gifts of healings by the one Spirit, and to another, the working of miracles, and to another, prophecy, foretelling the future, speaking a new message from God to the people, and to another, discernment of spirits, the ability to distinguish sound, godly doctrine from the deceptive doctrine of man-made religions and cults, to other, various kinds of unknown tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. All these things, the gifts, the achievements, the abilities, the empowering, are brought about by one and the same Holy Spirit, distributing to each one individually just as he chooses. For just as the body is one and yet has many parts, and all the parts, though many, form only one body, so it is with Christ. For by one Holy Spirit we were all baptized into one body, spiritually transformed, united together, whether Jews or Greeks, Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Holy Spirit, since the same Holy Spirit fills each life. For the human body does not consist of one part, but of many limbs and organs. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, is it not, on the contrary, still a part of the body? If the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, is it not, on the contrary, still a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? 
But now, as things really are, God has placed and arranged the parts in the body, each one of them, just as he willed and saw fit, with the best balance of function. If they all were a single organ, where would the rest of the body be? But now, as things really are, there are many parts, different limbs and organs, but a single body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. But quite the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are absolutely necessary. And as for those parts of the body which we consider less honorable, these we treat with greater honor, and our less presentable parts are treated with greater modesty, while our more presentable parts do not require it. But God has combined the whole body, giving greater honor to that part which lacks it, so that there would be no division or discord in the body, that is, lack of adaptation of the parts to each other, but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. And if one member suffers, all the parts share the suffering. If one member is honored, all rejoice with it. Now you, collectively, are Christ's body, and individually you are members of it, each with his own special purpose and function. So God has appointed and placed in the church for his own use, first apostles chosen by Christ, second prophets, those who foretell the future, those who speak a new message from God to the people, third teachers, then those who work miracles, then those with gifts of healings, the helpers, the administrators, and speakers in various kinds of unknown tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire and strive for the greater gifts if acquiring them is going to be your goal. And yet I will show you a still more excellent way, one of the choicest graces and the highest of them all, unselfish love. 1 Corinthians 13, The Excellence of Love If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love for others growing out of God's love for me, then I have become only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, just an annoying distraction. And if I have the gifts of prophecy and speak a new message from God to the people, and understand all mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have all sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains but do not have love, reaching out to others, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it does me no good at all. Love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful and is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and is not proud or arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked nor overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices with the truth when right and truth prevail. Love bears all things, regardless of what comes, believes all things, looking for the best in each one, hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times, endures all things without weakening. Love never fails, it never fades nor ends. But as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for the gift of special knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, for our knowledge is fragmentary and incomplete. But when that which is complete and perfect comes, that which is incomplete and partial will pass away. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now, in this time of imperfection, we see in a mirror dimly a blurred reflection, a riddle, an enigma, but then, when the time of perfection comes, we will see reality face to face. Now I know in part, just in fragments, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known by God. And now there remain faith, abiding trust in God and His promises, hope, confident expectation of eternal salvation, love, unselfish love for others growing out of God's love for me. These three, the choicest graces, but the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians 14. Prophecy, a superior gift. Pursue this. Love with eagerness, make it your goal. Yet earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual gifts, to be used by believers for the benefit of the church, but especially that you may prophesy, to foretell the future, to speak a new message from God to the people. 
For one who speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak to people but to God, for no one understands him or catches his meaning, but by the Spirit he speaks mysteries, secret truths, hidden things. But on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to the people for edification, to promote their spiritual growth, and speaks words of encouragement to uphold and advise them concerning the matters of God, and speaks words of consolation to compassionately comfort them. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church, promotes growth in spiritual wisdom, devotion, holiness, and joy. Now I wish that all of you spoke in unknown tongues, but even more I wish that you would prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater and more useful than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he translates or explains what he says, so that the church may be edified, instructed, improved, strengthened. Now believers, if I come to you speaking in unknown tongues, how will I benefit you unless I also speak to you clearly, either by revelation revealing God's mystery, or by knowledge teaching about God, or by prophecy foretelling the future speaking a new message from God to the people, or by instruction teaching the precepts that develop spiritual maturity? Yet even lifeless things, whether flute or harp, when producing a sound, if they do not produce distinct musical tones, how will anyone listening know what is piped or played? And if the war bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So it is with you. If you speak words in an unknown tongue that are not intelligible and clear, how will anyone understand what you are saying? You will be talking into the air, wasting your breath. There are, I suppose, a great many kinds of languages in the world unknown to us, and none is lacking in meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will appear to be a foreigner to the one who is speaking, since he knows exactly what he is saying, and the one who is speaking will appear to be a foreigner to me. So it is with you, since you are so very eager to have spiritual gifts and manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in ways that build up the church spiritually. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may be gifted to translate or explain what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive, because it does not understand what my spirit is praying. Then what am I to do? I will pray with the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit that is within me, and I will pray with the mind, using words I understand. I will sing with the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit that is within me, and I will sing with the mind, using words I understand. Otherwise, if you bless and give thanks to God in the Spirit only, how will any outsider or someone who is not gifted in spiritual matters say the Amen of agreement to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you are saying? You are giving thanks well enough in a way that God is glorified, but the other person who does not understand you is not edified and spiritually strengthened since he cannot join in your thanksgiving. I thank God that I speak in unknown tongues more than all of you, Nevertheless, in public worship, I would rather say five understandable words in order to instruct others than ten thousand words in a tongue which others cannot understand. Instruction for the Church Brothers and sisters, do not be children, immature, childlike in your thinking. Be infants in matters of evil, completely innocent and inexperienced, but in your minds be mature adults. It is written in the law, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people, and not even then will they listen to me, says the Lord. Therefore, unknown tongues are meant for a supernatural sign, not to believers but to unbelievers who might be receptive, while prophecy, foretelling the future, speaking a new message from God to the people, is not for unbelievers but for believers. So then, if the whole church gathers together and all of you speak in unknown tongues, and outsiders or those who are not gifted in spiritual matters or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophecy, foretelling the future, speaking a new message from God to the people, and an unbeliever or outsider comes in, he is convicted of his sins by all, and he is called to account by all because he can understand what is being said. The secrets of his heart are laid bare, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God, declaring that God is really among you, what then is the right course, believers? When you meet together, each one has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, disclosure of spiritual knowledge, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let everything be constructive and edifying and done for the good of all the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be limited to two or at the most three, 
and each one speaking in turn, and one must interpret what is said. But if there is no one to interpret, the one who wishes to speak in a tongue must keep silent in church. Let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak as inspired by the Holy Spirit, while the rest pay attention and weigh carefully what is said. But if an inspired revelation is made to another who is seated, then the first one must be silent. For in this way you can all prophesy one by one, so that everyone may be instructed and everyone may be encouraged. For the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets. The prophecy is under the speaker's control and he can stop speaking. For God, who is the source of their prophesying, is not a God of confusion and disorder, but of peace and order. As is the practice in all the churches of the saints, God's people, the women should be silent in the churches, for they are not authorized to speak, but are to take a subordinate place, as the law says. If there is anything they want to learn, that is, if they have questions about anything being said or taught, they are to ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to talk in church. Did the word of the Lord originate from you, Corinthians, or has it come to you only so that you know best what God requires? If anyone thinks and claims that he is a prophet, a true spokesman for God, or spiritually astute, filled with and energized by the Holy Spirit, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. If anyone does not recognize this, that it is a command of the Lord, he is not recognized by God. Therefore, believers, desire earnestly to prophesy, to foretell the future, to speak a new message from God to the people, and do not forbid speaking in unknown tongues, but all things must be done appropriately and in an orderly manner. 1 Corinthians 15 The Fact of Christ's Resurrection Now, brothers and sisters, let me remind you once again of the good news of salvation which I preached to you, which you welcomed and accepted, and on which you stand by faith. By this faith you are saved, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for his purpose. If you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, just superficially and without complete commitment. For I passed on to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to that which the scriptures foretold, and that he was buried and that he was bodily raised on the third day according to that which the scriptures foretold and that he appeared to Cephas Peter, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, the majority of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep in death. Then he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely, prematurely, traumatically born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least worthy of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I at one time fiercely oppressed and violently persecuted the church of God. But by the remarkable grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not without effect. In fact, I worked harder than all of the apostles, though it was not I, but the grace of God, his unmerited favor and blessing, which was with me. So whether it was I or they, this is what we preach." and this is what you believed and trusted in and relied on with confidence. Now if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how is it that some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, useless, amounting to nothing, and your faith is also vain, imaginary, unfounded, devoid of value and benefit, not based on truth. We are even discovered to be false witnesses misrepresenting God, because we testified concerning him that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ had not been raised either. And if Christ had not been raised, your faith is worthless and powerless, mere delusion. You are still in your sins and under the control and penalty of sin. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If we who are abiding in Christ have hoped only in this life, and this is all there is, then we are of all people most miserable and to be pitied. The order of resurrection. But now, as things really are, Christ has in fact been raised from the dead, and he became the first fruits, that is, the first to be resurrected with an incorruptible, immortal body, foreshadowing the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep in death. For since it was by a man that death came into the world, it is also by a man that the resurrection of the dead has come. For just as in Adam all die, 
so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then those who are Christ's own, will be resurrected with incorruptible, immortal bodies at his coming. After that comes the end, completion, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has made inoperative and abolished every ruler and every authority and power. For Christ must reign as king until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished and put to an end is death. For he, the Father, has put all things in subjection under his, Christ, feet. But when he says all things have been put in subjection under Christ, it is clear that he, the Father, who put all things in subjection to him, Christ, is accepted since the Father is not in subjection to his own Son. However, when all things are subjected to him, Christ, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one, the Father, who put all things under him, so that God may be all in all, manifesting his glory without any opposition, the supreme indwelling and controlling factor of life. Otherwise, what will those do who are being baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people even baptized for them? For that matter, why are we running such risks and putting ourselves in danger nearly every hour if there is no resurrection? I assure you, believers, by the pride which I have in you in your union with Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily, I face death and die to self. What good has it done me if merely from a human point of view I fought with wild animals at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised at all, let us eat and drink enjoying ourselves now, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Be sober-minded, be sensible, wake up from your spiritual stupor, as you ought, and stop sinning. For some of you have no knowledge of God. You are disgracefully ignorant of Him and ignore His truths. I say this to your shame. But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body will they come? You fool! Every time you plant seed, you sow something that does not come to life, germinating, springing up, and growing unless it first dies. The seed you sow is not the body, the plant, which it is going to become, but it is a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body just as he planned, and to each kind of seed a body of its own is given. All flesh is not the same. There is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are also heavenly bodies, sun, moon, stars, and earthly bodies, humans, animals, and plants, but the glory and beauty of the heavenly is one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is a glory and beauty of the sun, another glory of the moon, and yet another distinctive glory of the stars, and one star differs from another in glory and brilliance. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. The human body that is sown is perishable and mortal. It is raised imperishable and immortal. It is sown in dishonor, and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it is raised in strength. It is sown a natural body, mortal, suited to earth. It is raised a spiritual body, immortal, suited to heaven. As surely as there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written in Scripture, The first man, Adam, became a living soul, an individual. The last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit restoring the dead to life. However, the spiritual, the immortal life is not first, but the physical, the mortal life, then the spiritual. The first man, Adam, is from the earth, earthy made of dust. The second man, Christ, the Lord, is from heaven. As is the earthly man, the man of dust, so are those who are of earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven." Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the heavenly, the man of heaven, the mystery of resurrection. Now I say this, believers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit nor be part of the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable mortal inherit the imperishable immortal. Listen very carefully. I tell you a mystery, a secret truth decreed by God and previously hidden but now revealed. We will not all sleep in death but we will all be completely changed, wondrously transformed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet call. For a trumpet will sound, and the dead who believed in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be completely changed, wondrously transformed. For this perishable part of us must put on the imperishable nature, 
and this mortal part of us that is capable of dying must put on immortality, which is freedom from death. And when this perishable puts on the imperishable, and this mortal puts on the immortality, then the scripture will be fulfilled that says, Death is swallowed up in victory, vanquished forever. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin, by which it brings death, is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory as conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, always doing your best and doing more than is needed, being continually aware that your labor, even to the point of exhaustion in the Lord, is not futile nor wasted. It is never without purpose. 1 Corinthians 16, Instructions and Greetings Now concerning the money collected for the relief of the saints in Jerusalem, you are to do the same as I directed the churches of Galatia to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put something aside, in proportion to his prosperity, and save it so that no collections will need to be made when I come. When I arrive, I will send whomever you approve with letters of authorization to take your gift of charity and love to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go too, they will accompany me. I will visit you after I go through Macedonia, for I am only passing through Macedonia. But it may be that I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that you may send me on my way to wherever I may go afterward. For I do not wish to see you right now just in passing, but I hope to remain with you for some time later on, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, because a wide door for effective service has opened to me in Ephesus, a very promising opportunity, and there are many adversaries. If Timothy comes, see to it that you put him at ease, so that he has nothing to fear in regard to you, for he is devotedly doing the Lord's work just as I am. So allow no one to treat him with disdain as if he were inconsequential, but send him off cordially and speed him on his way, in peace, so that he may come to me, for I am expecting him to come along with the other brothers. As for our brother Apollos, I have strongly encouraged him to visit you with the other brothers. It was not at all his desire to come now, but he will come when he has the opportunity. Be on guard. Stand firm in your faith, in God, respecting his precepts and keeping your doctrine sound. Act like mature men and be courageous, be strong. Let everything you do be done in love, motivated and inspired by God's love for us. Brothers and sisters, you know that those of the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves for ministry to God's people, now I urge you to be subject to such leaders, treating them with courtesy and respect, and to everyone who helps in the work and labors for the benefit of yourselves and the church. I rejoice because Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achikas have arrived, for they have made up for your absence. They have refreshed my spirit as well as yours, so fully acknowledge such men and deeply appreciate them. The churches of Asia send you their greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church that meets in their house, send you their warm greetings in the Lord. All the believers greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. This greeting is in my own hand, Paul. If anyone does not love the Lord, does not obey and respect and believe in Jesus Christ and his message, he is to be accursed. Marantha, O our Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus, his unmerited favor, his spiritual blessing, his profound mercy be with you. My love be with all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen.